Hello, and welcome to St. Stephen's Online Worship for August 30th. My name is Forrest Teague. I'm one of the pastors here at St. Stephen's, along with Pastor Rob Robertson and Pastor Gian Kim. We are honored that you have joined us to worship the Lord together. And we hope that you would explore getting connected to St. Stephen's. And you can do so by checking out our website, our emails, even our snail mail, or by our Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. Now, as we prepare our hearts and minds for worship, we now light our Christ candle, which represents Christ's presence in worship with us today. Let us worship the Lord. I invite you to be called to worship. Come in from the night. It is a new day, and this is where love lives. Take off your coat. Let the weight fall off your shoulders. For here you are known. Here you are loved. Come in from the rain. We can do anything together. We can survive together. When the world unravels from under your feet, come in. Come in. Come in. God is here. You are home. You will never be alone. Let us worship the God who weaves us together. Let us join together in our opening prayer. Holy God, we have been angry because we see suffering and we don't understand. We have been skeptical because we know heartbreak that doesn't seem fair. We have withheld love because sacrifice only feels real when it's our own. Forgive us for forgetting that you created the heavens and the earth. Forgive us for withholding our pain from you. Forgive us for thinking that we know everything. When the world falls apart around us, when love unravels and life slowly fails, draw us in. Show us grace, for you gave the wind its weight, and you gave our bodies life. Forgive us for forgetting that. Amen. Our opening song is In the Valley. that I 
I go into the darkness, the more I see their radiant light. So let me learn that my losses are my gain. To be broken is to heal. That the valley is where your power is. Greeting boys and girls, this is Pastor Rob Robertson and I am so glad to be able to share the children's message with you today. I have been reading from my Bible and one of the verses that I have been reading over and over again this week is, build houses and live in them, plant gardens and eat whatever they produce. I wanna tell you a story about when I was a kid, I wanted to build a tree house, a tree house way, way up in a tree. But in my yard, there were no tall trees at all. I never got a tree house. And I was really disappointed. But you know what I get, did get to do? Someone gave me a birdhouse to build. And you know what? I didn't build a tree house for myself, but I built a house for the birds. And so it's kind of a, 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 a sad joke back then, but I'm really glad now. I was building something for the birds, for someone else. And when we open up the Bible, we're using our hearts to do something for someone else. Have you ever built anything? What would you use if you were going to build something? Let me show you a couple of uh, tools that I brought. Don't go anywhere. So I, I brought, you know what this is, don't you? It's a saw, right? It saws wood so that we can, we, we can make long pieces of wood shorter that we can build. And how long do you know uh, how long the pieces are supposed to be? What do you do? You, you measure. I brought a tape measure. And then if you have nails, what do you have to do? You have to hammer them in to the wood so that it all holds together, right? And then I brought one more tool. I brought a wrench. Sometimes we have to use a wrench to tighten bolts and things like that so that the whole structure stays strong and stays together. Well, you know, we're not only building houses for people to live in or birds to live in, we're also building a home of our own with God. And we've got an important tool that we need to use. Do you know what that tool is? More than perhaps any other tool that God has given us, God's given us the Bible, right? I know Pastor Gian talks a lot with you about the Bible, B-I-B-L-E, doesn't she? 
And the Bible is God's word. It tells us how we're called to build our lives in relationship with God, to be close to God, but also that we can be close to one another. Even in this time when we don't get to see each other on Sundays and other times during the week, we can be close to one another because we're close to God. And so I encourage you to find your B-I-B-L-E and ask someone to help you read it or read it yourself, to find those stories in the Bible that help you stay close to God and help you stay close to one another. Let's pray together. Would you repeat after me? Dear God, help us to build a life with you. Amen. As we prepare to give, I want to share with you two things before we pray and ask the Lord to bless our tithes and offerings. First, M. Angel Katala was recommended recently by a charge conference as a candidate for ordained ministry in the United Methodist Church. We are thankful for how God is working in M's life, but also in the life of St. Stephen's. And speaking of thankfulness, the Stewardship Committee has been meeting and preparing for uh, October Stewardship Series. Thankfulness has been selected as the title for that series, even in challenging times. We have so very much to be thankful for as we prepare for the giving of our tithes and offerings. Let us pray. Loving God, in thankfulness, we come in prayer as we prepare to give. Thankful for all the ways that you bless us. We ask you to multiply these gifts as we build and grow and share in your amazing love and grace with the world. We are thankful for our relationship with you through Jesus Christ in the power of the Holy Spirit. And we are thankful for our church family. Bless our thankfulness series and the work of the Stewardship Committee that as a community of faith, St. Stephen's will, will seek to grow an even greater spirit of appreciation all year long. It is in Jesus' name we pray, amen. The slideshow that accompanies the offertory today is pictures from Grace Ministries. Grace Ministries is one of the uh, important ways that St. Stephen's reaches out to the world with God's love and grace. Would you pray with me? God of wisdom, as we share your word and find the good news in your presence, we ask that you open our ears to hear your voice and open our hearts to experience your power, which leads us from pain and worries to peace and comfort. In your son's holy name we pray. 
Amen. Today we are concluding our sermon series, Unraveled, Seeking God When Our Plans Fall Apart. This sermon series has helped us to find out how to unravel real-life challenges and examine where God meets us in our lives. Each week for the past two months, we have talked about biblical figures who exemplify a faithful life and bring us a message of hope, peace, joy, and dream. The message that we all need to hear as we have gone through this challenging time all over the world and dealt with various social issues in the community. Today we take a journey with a person in the Old Testament who is known as a faithful person and who suffered all kinds of painful losses. The Bible described him as a blameless and upright who feared God and turned away from evil. He had seven sons and three daughters, 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, 500 donkeys, and many servants. The Bible says this man was the greatest of all the people of the East. Everything seemed perfect until Satan began to be involved in his life. His name is Job. His perfect life turned upside down one day, probably within a couple of hours. He lost all his children and all livestock, but he kept his faith in God. Satan interrupted Job's life again and struck him with terrible sores from head to foot. Now Job even lost his health in his grieving process. All of these things happened just in the first couple of chapters of the book of Job. The book of Job is composed of 42 chapters. It is like a short novel or poetic dialogue between Job and his friends or Job and God. Biblical scholars have different opinions on the book of Job. Who are the authors? When was this book completed? What are the original parts? What parts were later editions? Unfortunately, I'm not able to answer those questions today. Rather, I'm focusing on the message of Job's life and how God's message is relevant to us today. I wonder if you have ever heard a sermon preached on Job before. Probably many of you have not because this is not an easy story to talk about. To be honest, while writing today's sermon, I wished I would have chosen a different scripture. It is my ninth year in ministry, and today is the first time for me to talk about Job in worship. It is certainly not easy to talk about all of the controversial topics in the book of Job, such as the meaning of suffering, the place of justice, the relationship between God and Satan, and the nature of God, and so on. Despite the difficulty to understand the book, I strongly encourage you to read the whole book of Job this week because you will find the word you need for your life no matter what situation you are in, no matter what life challenges you are facing, and regardless of what stage of faith you are in. Here's a scripture I'd like to share with you today. It comes from the 28th chapter of the book of Job, after the conversation between Job and his three friends. The scripture is one of the most beautiful poems in the entire Bible. I'm reading verses 12 through 28 from New Revised Standard Version. Listen now for the word of God. But where shall wisdom be found, and where is a place of understanding? Mortals do not know the way to it, and it is not found in the land of the living. The deep says, it is not in me, and the sea says, it is not with me. It cannot be gotten for gold, 
and silver cannot be weighted out as its price. It cannot be valued in the gold of Ophir, in precious onyx and sapphire. Gold and glass cannot equal it, nor can it be exchanged for jewels of fine gold. No mention shall be made of coral or of crystal. The price of wisdom is above pearls. The chrysolite of Ethiopia cannot compare with it, nor can it be valued in pure gold. Where then does wisdom come from? And where is a place of understanding? It is hidden from the eyes of all living and concealed from the birds of the air. Abaddon and Beth say, we have heard a rumor of it with our ears. God understands the way to it, and he knows its place, for he looks to the ends of the earth and sees everything under the heavens. When he gave to the winds its weight and apportioned out the waters by measure, when he made a decree for the rain and a way for the thunderbolt, then he saw it and declared it, he established it and searched it out. And he said to humankind, Truly, the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom, and to depart from evil is understanding. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Chapter 28 is considered a hymn to wisdom or the power on wisdom. It beautifully teaches us about the wisdom of God. This chapter is regarded as an additional insert by another author. If you read from chapter 27, it seems like Job speaks this poem as a continued response to his friends. But chapter 29 begins, Job again took up his discourse and said. It means that the previous part was not spoken by him. Regardless of the speaker, the poem still reminds us of God's wisdom and why we need wisdom from God. We as human beings have risen, a gift of God, to think and understand what is going on around us and in the world. Reason is different from wisdom. With our reason, we like to know what makes sense. Nonsense causes us stress. If everything is understandable and reasonable with our wisdom, we might not need God. If everything is perfect and we are perfect too, we might not need God. That is not the way God created the world. Everything has been in God's hands since the beginning. I believe that the perfect order of God's creation God's providence is not about perfection. Everything in all creation needs God. That is a perfect order of God's creation. From this perspective, Job's life looks perfect. He lost everything, and he desperately needed God and God's wisdom. My understanding of wisdom is the power to accept something even though we cannot understand why. Wisdom is also the power to let things go and let God be in control. It is the power to submit to God's will. We as humans are drawn to people who are strong and victorious over the enemy, like David. Someone who eventually overcomes challenges like Moses and Esther. Someone who continues to worship and praise God regardless of the obstacles in life, such as Paul. Someone who is saved and blessed by God after a time of difficulty, like Jacob and Ruth. We love heroes. And I also love heroes who exemplify faithfulness no matter what situations they are in and no matter what challenges they have to deal with. What about Job? Is he a hero? I don't know about you, but I wouldn't want to be Job. 
What I learned about Job in my childhood is that Job was faithful even though he had nothing. As I grew up a bit, I learned from his life that bad things could happen to a good person, and Job was still faithful. I was taught about a part of his story, not the whole. If you read through the whole book of Job, you would know who Job truly is and discover his cries and complaints to God. Job kept his faith strong for a while. But eventually, he began to blame and complain to God and lament over his situation. He says, now they make sport of me, those who are younger than I. Now they mocked me. I cry to you and you do not answer me, God. I stand and you merely look at me. You have turned cruel to me with the might of your hand. You persecute me. This is what he said. Now he is just like one of us, being tempted, tested, shaken by people and their behaviors, lamenting over his situation and questioning God. Like all of us, Job needs wisdom. Today's scripture raises the same question in two different places. Where does wisdom come from? With beautiful poetic expressions, the writer describes the hidden feature of wisdom. Mortals don't know the way to wisdom. It is hidden from the eyes of all living and concealed from the birds of the air. And the writer praises that God understands the way to wisdom, and God knows its place. Then God says, truly, the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom, and to depart from evil is understanding. Earlier I shared with you my understanding of the perfection of God's creation, the perfect status that everything in the universe needs God and God's wisdom. In our human wisdom, all of the pain that Job had to endure might mean that God abandoned him. Some people believe that wisdom and wealth are blessings from God, yet in God's wisdom, your possessions are not necessarily a blessing, and your pain is not necessarily a punishment. The story of Job teaches us that God never abandons God's children regardless of circumstances, good or bad. God certainly blesses all of his precious children, including you and me, even if God's way might not be fully understandable and God's blessing might be different from our wishes and hopes. God's ways are not our ways and the trials and tribulations of this life as well, as our blessings draw us closer to God and strengthen our relationship with God. The story of Job testifies to this. The Apostle Paul, in his letter to the church in Corinth and to believers everywhere, reminds us, for God's foolishness is wiser than human wisdom and God's weakness is stronger than human strength. Our human minds cannot fully understand God and God's wisdom. That is why we should ask for God's wisdom. The wisdom of God is giving us and teaching us to get a better understanding of the nature of God so that we are freed from our human thoughts. Here is my personal story. Until the past week, I had never experienced the shedding tears while reading the Bible. My tears were not about compassion for Job's losses. It was about my repentance as I read the book of Job, because Job's confession and cries were not very different from mine. I often questioned God, isn't it enough? During the pandemic, I often asked this question, isn't it enough? 
I'm trying my best. I've reached my limit. My endurance is getting worse. Isn't it enough? Yet, while reading the book of Job, I realized that all my thoughts and habitual laments were self-centered, not God-centered. I thought about what I have done, not what God has done. I thought about what I can do rather than what God can do. I thought about who I am rather than who God is. My focus was on me, not God. I couldn't help weeping when I realized my spiritual weakness. Yes, this is my shameful confession. I still have many questions about the book of Job and cannot answer all theological or controversial questions on the book of Job. However, what I discovered from my own experience breaking my spiritual arrogance into pieces is about my own weakness and God's wisdom and God's greatness. There is no one who can say before God, I am not a sinner. I am innocent, I am perfect, and I am righteous. No one can be arrogant in faith. Later in the book, Elihu condemns Job's self-righteousness. He also said, God delivers the afflicted by their affliction and opens their ear by adversity. We don't always know why bad things happen to a good person. But we know that the God, the creator, has power to use all situations, good or bad, to teach us a lesson and develop spiritual endurance. What does it mean for you to live as a Christian who knows God and the love of God? Does it mean that you will never face adversity? Will you be free from all kinds of challenges and difficulties in this world? No. I cannot tell you that my faith is stronger than yours. How could I dare to say that I'm more faithful than you? I cannot compare my faith to yours being a pastor doesn't mean that I can judge others' faith. That is not why I'm called to ministry. The reason that I'm called to proclaim the word of God is to teach God's people, you, who are listening or watching this sermon, about the love of God and support to you when you find yourself in the difficult challenges of life. Sometimes, Logic doesn't make sense because it doesn't help us understand life challenges and obstacles. But wisdom gives us the perseverance to ensure and overcome the obstacles in our life through wisdom. Because wisdom comes from God, it strengthens our spirituality, and it enables us to hear the message of peace and comfort. I was in awe as I read the whole book of Job and found out something that I hadn't noticed before. In chapter 1, Job had seven sons and three daughters, and he lost all of them. In chapter 42, the last chapter of the book, Job had again seven sons and three daughters after all what he has gone through. In the end, because of Job's faithful confession, God rewarded him with the blessing of restoration and prosperity. Job, Job received more sheep, camels, and animals. Even though Job prospered, in the end, he was not the same person he used to be. His original family was still gone and he had to start over and rebuild his life. Without an exception, all of us have experienced a global pandemic. 
Going through these challenging times, I have noticed that some people focus only on the difficulties, and some people focus on the bright side, reasons of joy, thanksgiving, fun, and laughter. What makes that difference? I think wisdom makes all the difference. I want us to be different than we used to be every time we go through a life challenge. I want us to be more God-centered, wiser, more humble, and more selfless so that we can put God first in our lives, so that our life builds up on the foundation of a faith, so that our thoughts, words, and actions deliver the saving grace and sacrificial love of God to the world. We should change. We cannot control and change most of the things around us, but I believe we can change ourselves as we ask for God's wisdom to see what we have to see and hear what we need to hear. God doesn't save us from all kinds of life challenges, not because God has no power to do, but because that is not the order of God's creation. The good news for us is that God saves us from sin and death through the life of Jesus Christ on the cross. When Job lost everything, his life was finally led by God's wisdom. We don't need to wait until we lose everything and go through calamity. Now is the time. Let us ask for God's wisdom and depend on God's wisdom. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Church, I ask you now to join me in prayer. God, we ask for your love to live through us. By the transformation of our hearts and minds, we will be your light to the world. In times of pandemic, riots, violence, and disasters, let us your people be a voice of peace, love, and justice in your holy name. God, we lift up to you all those who are ill, those who have COVID, and those who are fighting to cure it. Give them strength. For the people returning to their jobs in person, we ask for safety and for patience of all. And Lord, our hearts and prayers cry out to you for those who are and will be affected by the hurricanes and other disasters that are ravaging our country and others. Lord, teach us all to live into your promises. For we trust you and we place our faith in you and you alone. And we do so because of your son Jesus, who was the one that taught us to pray and the power of prayer. So now, let us join in praying the Lord's Prayer, first taught to us by Jesus. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Receive now this benediction. My friends in Christ, may the wisdom of God lead every step of your life and give you power 
to submit all things to God's will. Go in peace. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.